Hi, I'm Dr. James Verheiden, Lodge Advisor for Lowell Wakwamgila Lodge, Orthopedic Hand and Upper Extremity Surgeon. Today, I'm going to talk about first aid tips and tricks when you're camping and backpacking. The most important thing you can bring in your first aid kit is knowledge. Knowledge is power. The more you learn, the more you know, the better first responder or first aid provider you will be. The second most important thing is prevention. They always say an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. This is even more important when you're doing ultralight backpacking. A little prevention can go a long way. So today we're going to talk a lot about different preventative techniques and tips to hopefully minimize uh, any injuries, hazards, or problems you have uh, on the trail. Dehydration. Probably the most common medical problem or medical issue we see, whether you're camping, you're at NOAC, World Jamboree, National Jamboree, or ultralight backpacking. I can't tell you how many times I've seen, I've seen scouts um, who are severely dehydrated, and that severe dehydration really limits and prevents uh, them from uh, enjoying the full experience, and it slows down the whole crew. When we go ultralight backpacking, we make sure that every individual ideally has four, four and a half liters of water filtered the night before they go to bed. Everyone carries at least two smart water bottles. These bottles are strong, they're durable, and they've been shown to last greater than a thousand miles on the trail. Ideally, these water bottles are filled the night before, each with a minimum of two liters of water. This is what individuals carry in their backpacks. In addition, I'm a big fan of these platypus uh, water containers. These hold just over two liters of water. Ideally, individuals filter two liters plus an additional two, two and a half liters the night before. The rate limiting step when you ultralight backpacking in the morning is usually getting your water filtered. Crews can spend a tremendous amount of time uh, getting water filtered before they're on the trail. It's amazing how one hour later on the trail makes a huge difference. Our goal when you're doing Philmont and the, these other ultralight backpacking treks is usually 10 by 10. 10 miles hiking by 10 a.m. This avoids the heat of the day. Uh, it's much easier to hike when it's cooler weather. Uh, individuals are stronger. And then typically you're rolling in a camp around noon, you shut things down. You do your program, you enjoy the swimming, you play, you have a great time. Dehydration, most common uh, thing. So before we leave, everyone has to camel up. Individuals usually drink one to two liters of water before they hit the trail. Good nutrition and fueling your body with a hearty breakfast in the morning are critical when you're ultralight backpacking. There's nothing worse than the whole crew taking off on a hike. You go a few miles and you have a scout bonks. And when you ask them, they say that they forgot to eat breakfast. They only had three or four bites of breakfast. This happened again and again, even on our backpacking trek, when you did the 110 mile trek in the Cascades. And we are an experienced crew. It's critical when you do film on. When you do film on and we do 140 mile backpack treks, we leave early in the morning Again, before the sun is up, we have cold breakfast and our breakfasts are stored in our pockets. So as we're hiking along, um, we continue to drink water and we're eating our protein bars, our energy bars, our snacks as we hike. So we eat our breakfast on the go. You cannot miss breakfast. When you're doing hiking 10, 15, 20 miles or more and a youth forgets their breakfast, again, they last a few miles, then they bonk. And there's nothing worse than slowing the crew down uh, than an individual who, who, who is bonking and not able to maintain the pace. Another very common problem when we see ultralight backpacking is too much sun exposure and sunburns. A sunburn in a youth can cause significant amount of skin damage and greatly increases that individual's risk for skin cancer in the future. One of the mandatory things that all of us wear when we're ultralight backpacking is a broad brim hat. Every individual 
is supposed to come with a broad brim hat and wear that hat while they're hiking. We were a little lax on this last uh, Cascade uh, backpacking trek, given all the COVID uh, issues that were going on. But when you go to Philmont, every single individual has to have a broad brim hat. We bring sunscreen as part of our crew gear. And a couple times a day, we make sure every individual on the crew applies sunscreen. Make sure sunscreen is an SPF 50 or higher. Make sure you apply the sunscreen liberally and frequently. Don't forget your lips. When you're out on these long backpacking treks, it's easy to get your lips dried, cracked. Make sure you put some sun balm on or lip balm and make sure that lip balm has S, uh, a sunscreen in it to protect your lips from sunburn. Nothing worse than getting a sunburn on your lips and then getting skin cancer, melanoma or basal cell or squamous cell carcinoma on your lips as you're an adult. This, uh, I brought an uh, ultralight umbrella on this backpacking trek when we went to the uh, Cascades. This uh, Z-Pack umbrella weighs just uh, over six ounces. It's kind of a luxury item. This is the first time I took it uh, hiking, but I'm gonna take it again. This umbrella protects from the wind, protects from the rain, and provides great protection from the sun. I was able to attach it to my ultralight backpacking, attaching to the chest strap. This little bungee cord with a little snap, I was also able to attach and I could adjust this. So if the sun was on my left, I had my umbrella on the left. If the sun was low in the sky, I had my umbrella tilted. If the sun was coming from the right, I had the umbrella up on top or angled if the sun was low in the sky. The nice thing, when I hiked with my umbrella on, I could hike hands-free. I didn't have to hold my umbrella, and I could also take off my hat. This umbrella provides much greater sun protection than a hat does, and allowed me to hike hands-free and let the wind blow through my uh, limited amounts of hair. Taking care of your feet on the trail is critically important when you're ultralight backpacking or doing any backpacking trek. There's nothing worse than starting a 110 mile backpack trek or 140 mile backpack trek and having a scout come up to you 20 miles into the trek, complaining of blisters on the feet, difficult time walking. Again, prevention is very important. We're gonna spend a fair amount of time talking about our feet because our feet are critical when you're doing one of these uh, long backpacking treks. First, proper shoe wear is critical. When you go to Philmont or do an ultralight backpacking trek, no scout, no scout can bring boots. There's nothing worse than having a big boot which weighs another uh, pound, pound and a half. It's like wearing ankle weights. That creates a tremendous amount of additional work, effort, and lost energy for that youth every step that they take. All of us wear trail running shoes. At Philmont, the trails are incredible. Over one million scouts have traveled the trails at Philmont. The trails have great tread, and you don't need anything more than a, a trail running shoe. No Gore-Tex. Shoes can have no Gore-Tex in them. At Philmont, especially the times when we typically go, it's monsoon season. It's a wonderful experience to go to Philmont during the monsoons. Here in Eastern Oregon, we typically don't get these big storms. Last time we were at Philmont, we had 14 plus inches of rain the 10 days we were on the trail. Monsoon, torrential rains. First, don't make that a deterrent to go to Philmont. Philmont is an unbelievable, epic experience. And for all of our individuals, I actually want them to go and experience these big monsoon thunderstorms because it's a great learning experience for them. Uh, a great experience to see these thunderstorms uh, form, uh, drench you and everything else, survive the storm, um, and, and then disappear just as quickly as they came. 
and it's all part of the experience. Um, but when you're in these storms, it's not uncommon to have inch, two inches. There are times we were hiking up to our calf or mid ankle uh, deep in water. And even if you're wearing these big thick boots, all lined with Gore-Tex, the water gets inside. The problem was when you're doing these long backpacking treks, you're hiking day after day after day. And when your boots get wet inside, they don't dry out. That Gore-Tex does not allow things to dry out. The first time we went to Philmont, two youth uh, convinced myself and uh, Kevin Patrick that they'd be fine, they wouldn't have any problems, and they convinced us that uh, it was okay to come along with their Gore-Tex trail running shoes. I spent half an hour to an hour each day working on those individuals' feet for the uh, every day after the first, the first or second day on the trail. It was painful for me, it was miserable for them, they did not have a good experience. No Gore-Tex, no boots. These shoes get wet, you can hike right through a stream, you can get stuck in a monsoon, torrential downpour, they're wet, you keep hiking and they dry out on the trails you're walking. It's important to have good socks. I'm a big fan of darn tough socks. These are nice wool socks. Uh, they stay warm even when they're wet. They're super durable. I've gone through many socks and of all the socks that I've tested, these have been the best. They have a lifetime warranty. Darn Tough claims you can have seven of these socks, do your laundry once a week, and you've got socks for the rest of your life. I'm a big fan. I get these, I think they're quarter length, so they come just above the top of my shoe. They're mid-weight socks. They provide great uh, support, protection, and they feel great. All of us, when you do these ultralight backpacking treks in our cruise, wear these gaiters. Um, these gaiters uh, snap on your shoe in the front. There's a little piece of Velcro in the back, and they prevent microparticulates, dust, fine dirt, etc., from getting inside your shoe. You get blisters because of friction, and that dirt and grime and debris and little stones over time irritate your skin, and that's why you get a bl blister. These things are ultra light. Um, Great location. Get these is dirty gir dirtygirlgators.com. Dirtygirlgators.com. Um, they're roughly fifteen dollars, but they're super lightweight, very durable. You hand wash them, and they uh, provide great uh, protection, limiting uh, fine dirt, dust, and debris from getting inside your shoes. Next important thing is being clean. We try to encourage our scouts to hop in the lake or take a shower every night they're on the trail. When they do that, when scouts are clean, they feel better, uh, they're happier, they sleep better, they keep the inside of their sleeping bag much cleaner. And it's really critical that you pay attention to your feet. Make sure your feet are clean. Before you go to bed, we try to encourage all our youth to wash their feet, especially between the toes. Clean them, dry them, put a fresh pair of socks on that they're gonna hike the next day and climb into bed. Then when they're going to sleep, those eight hours or so in their sleeping bag, their foot will rest, recharge, and be ready for the next day. It's really critical to keep your, keep your feet clean. When you're hiking along the trail, if you come to a lake or a stream and your feet are tired, take off your shoes, soak them in the ice cold water by that uh, glacier fed uh, stream or that lake for a few minutes. It's amazing what that cooling effect will do for your feet. It greatly decreases the swelling. It's like a little ice bath. It can provide a, a great comfort for your feet. Um, and it really helps your uh, feet uh, and minimize the risk for blisters. We talked about blisters. You get blisters because of friction. You wanna prevent friction by limiting dust and dirt from getting into your shoes with the gaiters. Have proper footwear, good socks, keeping your feet clean. You can sometimes use mole skin. I carry a piece of this with me in my first aid kit. Mole skin works great for your heels and you can put it over uh, the top. Sometimes um, even a piece of duct tape works really good to distribute the force and compression. 
even better way is to prevent blisters. And I'm a big fan of this run goo or there's tri glide or shoe glide. There's a number of different things where you just kind of, uh, it rolls on. Um, this is kind of a goo. It's a very slippery, it's almost like a petroleum jelly type substance. And any individuals who's at risk for getting blisters, I always carry a pack of this in my first aid kit and I have them uh, put a, a liberal amount on their fingertips and they run it between uh, their toes and any area that's prone to blisters. This stuff is amazing. And since we've been using this, I've had essentially zero, a very limited amount of scouts who've um, gotten blisters after using this. This stuff also works great if you get chafing between your legs from, uh, um, from hygiene issues or just hiking long distance in that hot, sweaty environment. And a little bit of this uh, uh, between your legs really limits that chafing and irritation. Huge fan of this run goo um, or this tri glide or shoe glide. There's a number of different things. You can fi find this in the shoe stores that sell uh, ultra light uh, trail running type shoes. Another thing that's really critical is hiking poles. Our scouts cannot go on one of these ultra late backpacking treks without hiking poles. These hiking poles are invaluable and critical to minimize uh, pressure and irritation on your feet and your knees when you're hiking. They go also greatly improve hiking efficiency. When you're hiking with hiking poles, uh, these hiking poles make your hiking 20% more efficient. We double them up for uh, poles for a lot of our ultralight backpacking tents, and they provide many other uh, uses. They're great for um, hiking uh, downhill for the adults, because when you hike downhill, we, promote, we put a tremendous amount of stress uh, on our joints, and this really decreases a lot of that stress. Whenever we're hiking downhill, I'm always by far uh, the, the last uh, person on the trail. I'm a little older, I gotta protect my knees, I'm a little more cautious. When you go downhill, you lengthen the poles. When you go uphill, you can sh uh, shorten the poles, shorten them up. So you're always uh, uh, using this. You always wanna be efficient, very minimal motion. You fire your triceps, and you use the triceps to propel yourself forward when you hike. If someone has an injury, like a femur fracture or tibial fracture on the trail, these things can also be used as a splint. You have two hiking poles. We'll talk about this in a little bit. And you can use this for your arm or for your femur. Make two of them, you co-band them together, and they can provide great longitudinal traction. You could probably even make um, a stretcher out of a couple poles as well, if need be. So these hiking poles are invaluable uh, on so many levels when you're backpacking, and they're another great preventative measure to limit injury, decrease stress, damage, and issues with your joints. They're also great for balance. When, when we hike South Sister and Middle Sister, there are a lot of areas that were quite technical, very difficult. You take one step up, you'd slide back, and, and these would help prevent you from sliding back and also help on your balance when you're going through these uneven rock and boulder fields. The one thing you have to be careful with these is if they get stuck in a rock, these poles do not do well with a bending force. We had a half a dozen poles which were uh, broken on our trek, usually from these big boulder fields. The scout would put on top, you'd slide between two rocks, they'd bend the pole and it would snap here or here. That was a, a common problem. We broke six poles on this last uh, backpacking trek. But the last couple times we went to Philmont uh, with three different crews, uh, we broke zero poles. Zero poles, we went to Philmont, six poles. When you do this Cascade Trek, it kind of shows you uh, how difficult our Cascade Trek was. It's important to stay healthy in the trail. Don't forget your toothpaste and your toothbrush. Brush your teeth every day. Don't forget your floss. It's amazing, you spend, especially for an adult, you spend 10 days on the trail, you don't brush your teeth, you don't floss, 
you can actually have significant uh, gum issues and teeth problems even after a short uh, stint on the trail. Stay clean. We always take uh, these Sea to Summit uh, uh, pocket shampoo, pocket soap, and again, we try to take a shower uh, every night. We frequently will hold, uh, set up a shower um, behind a few trees. If need be, you can put a little tarp around it for privacy, but um, it's good to stay clean and, and, and use biodegradable soap and shampoo ev every evening. Camp suds, hand sanitizer are, are critical to use before you eat and really critical to use after going to the bathroom. There's nothing worse than getting a dysentery type of reaction when getting the runs or squirts from an individual. Oftentimes that's from bad hygiene. Make sure all individuals know that when they use the trowel, the trowel is only used to dig the hole. The trowel never touches the poo or the toilet paper. The trowel used to dig the hole, you do your job, and then you uh, fill that hole with the trowel, but it never touches the toilet paper or the poo. And then you sanitize your hands, use camp suds uh, every single time after going to the bathroom and before you eat. Again, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Again, it's critical to protect your feet and have good, healthy feet on the trail. One of the ways is make sure as an adult advisor in your first aid kit, bring a toenail clipper with you. There's nothing worse than having a youth and an adult forget to trim their toenails before they come on the trail. The toenails are too long, they irritate, they cause a blister. What's probably even worse is trimming your, to your toenails too short. When you trim your nail, don't trim them too short and always trim your nail flat across. Sometimes people are tempted to take a little bit off the ends and, and shorten it up. The problem is our soft tissue here, if that nail's too short, when you're hiking, the pulp will dig into that sharp, freshly cut edge, irritate things, and you'll get an infection on the side of your nail, either your toenail or your fingernail. It's called a perinicule infection. Uh, that can be a, a, a quite painful and problematic is really difficult when you're doing a long backpacking trek if you get an infected toenail. So I always carry one of these, but make sure you don't trim your nails uh, too short. We always bring a little pocket knife. When you go to Philmont, a crew of 12, we take two little pocket knives this size. That's all we take for the whole crew. I've got so, so many youths who uh, love their knives and before we do the pack shakedown, they have three or four knives stuck in their pack. We empty everything out, we go through things uh, one by one. The crew only needs two knives. These knives are, we've never used them at Philmont, um, but they can be used in emergency fashion for a couple reasons. Little tweezers are great for removing foreign bodies, slivers, little things like that. These things can be sterilized or you can sterilize the, the knife. I don't bring a scalpel with me when I'm ultralight backpacking because I don't carry the weight. If I have to do a little emergency surgery procedure on the trail, I take out the little uh, uh, Swiss Army knife, I sterilize the tip, uh, and I use that. If you don't have a, a little tweezers, I'd encourage you to put a small tweezers in your uh, first aid kit but usually a Swiss Army knife will do the trick. EpiPen. There's nothing worse than individual having an anaphylactic reaction on the trail. I actually saw this uh, at uh, Philmont, uh, um, someone we came upon, um, someone on the trail, he was actually a staff member who was uh, fishing one of the lakes, we came up, he was just stung by a bee, and I assisted uh, with management for his uh, anaphylactic reaction. Um, I always try to carry an EpiPen with me. The downsides, these things can be incredibly expensive. I think uh, uh, these pens cost five to $600 for one pen. And ideally, you have to carry two pens with you, 
because if someone is stung by a bee or develops some other type of anaphylactic reaction where their lips swell, their tongue swells, their throat swells, they have difficult times swallowing and breathing, the treatment of choice is giving epinephrine. You can give them a, an epi shot and usually one is sufficient, but sometimes, depending on the anaphylactic reaction, an individual looks good, and after 20 minutes, they start going into anaphylaxis again. So anytime someone has an anaphylactic reaction, they need to uh, uh, seek a primary medical uh, treatment right away, and ideally you have two EpiPens available uh, in case uh, they develop recurrent an anaphylactic symptoms. It's nice if you have a physician who's on, as an advisor who's on crew with you, and many of you do. So if that is the case, um, have the physician bring along a little bottle of adrenaline. So adrenaline, epinephrine, the same thing. And I get this from uh, basically the anesthesia card in the operating room. And from the anesthesia card, and given what I do, um, it's, uh, it's uh, very inexpensive, you know what I mean, compared to a five to $600 uh, EpiPen. I also get a one cc TB syringe. And this one cc TB syringe and this little bottle of adrenaline is a lot smaller and lighter than this EpiPen. This is actually a junior EpiPen. And this, you can actually use a, a, a couple doses. So if you um, have a physician who's on board with you, encourage them to bring a small bottle of adrenaline and a 1cc TB syringe just in case someone has an anaphylactic reaction. If you can get one, an important thing to put in your first aid kit is a little face shield. If someone goes down, they're not responsive, and you have to initiate CPR, it's nice to put a covering over their face for when you do the mouth-to-mouth -mouth portion of CPR. Many times when people go down, people are hesitant to jump in and do CPR because they don't want to put their mouth or their lips to someone else's lips. If that's the case and you don't have one of these face shields, start initiating chest compressions. The magic number really is 30 and two if you're doing 30 chest compressions for every uh, two breaths. But the most important thing is initiating chest compressions. If you don't do anything, and that person's heart is stopped, if you don't do anything, every patient dies. Every patient dies. If you initiate chest compressions, you give them a chance. And that is really important. As a first responder, first aid provider, little bystander, your goal is to try to give that person a chance until more definitive help can arrive. Don't not do CPR because you're afraid to put your lips to, some, to someone else's lips. If you don't feel comfortable, if they're sick, they're vomiting, COVID, initiate chest compressions. Boom, 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 boom. Staying alive, staying alive. Ooh, 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 ooh. Staying alive. And that is the beat you want to go to. That beat is about 100 compressions a minute. And just think of that song, staying alive, staying alive, ooh, 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 staying alive. And that's the compressions you wanna do. Right here, the xiphoid process. You feel your chest, there's a little soft spot right here. This is where you wanna do the chest compressions. You wanna make sure those chest compressions are going down a good inch. Good, firm chest compressions to that staying alive, staying alive. In my first aid kit, I also carry a little splint. This is a dorsal padded loom foam splint. It's super light, has many uses. It's great for splinting the finger. I can trim it. If you get an injury out here, you only want to mobilize this portion. This joint to the hand gets stiff very, very quickly. It doesn't like to be injured and mobilized or operated on and gets super, super stiff. So sometimes you're putting a splint right here. I always carry a roll of, of, of athletic tape, quarter inch tape, super durable, super strong, as many uses and conditions these splints, but a little splint here or something else, this works great. I also always carry a couple rolls of Coban. This is Coban or Vet Wrap. 
This can be reusable, it's sticky, it has many uses to uh, keep a dressing adhered, put a splint on. If someone has a fracture, you can use your hiking poles as a provisional splint. You can use your little sits pad that you sit on and you can wrap that around somebody's arm and you can secure it um, with your Coban. This Coban is great, has many uh, uses. Another great use, when we're hiking, many of the times we're hiking, a lot of the individuals I'm hiking with are 13, 14, 15 years old. And at that age, youth are rapidly growing. And when they're rapidly growing, it's not uncommon for them to have tendonitis problems. And I've seen this many times. And if you look, my leg, my thigh, this quadriceps muscle, is attached via a quadriceps tendon to your kneecap or your patella, via your patellar tendon to your tibial tubercle. And right down here, just below your kneecap, it's not uncommon for individuals to be quite painful and uncomfortable when they're hiking. And the reason is because they're skeletally immature, they're growing, this growth plate hasn't completely fused, you're firing the muscles, you're going up and down hills, and as that, that muscle is firing, pulling through all these structures, it's lifting off that piece of bone which isn't completely fused. This Coban wrap is, uh, works wonders to wrap a couple strips right around here, right around that tibial tubercle area to minimize the lifting off of that bone um, every time you, your muscle fires and contracts. It's also very useful for um, older youth or adults who develop tendonitis. It's not uncommon when you're hiking on uneven terrain, up boulder patches, screes, stuff like that, develop quadriceps tendonitis, where the quadriceps attaches to the top of the kneecap, or patellar tendonitis, where you pain at the bottom of the kneecap where the tendon inserts. So if people are tender just at the very tip, the top of the kneecap or the bottom portion, they usually have an insertional tendonitis. And again, this Coben wrap, um, wrapped around that area was is frequently helpful and beneficial for those problems if someone's on the trail they slip they fall and they get a puncture wound imagine this is a stick or something that's sticking into their arm or sticking on the side of their body or their leg really important if they got something that's sticking out do not pull it out in general you do not want to be pulling out puncture wounds, foreign bodies, objects out of your body when you're already in the trail because you don't know how deep this foreign body has gone. It's always tempting to pull it out. We see it happening all the time in the movies, but you pull this structure out and if this twig or stick got embedded in deep, it could have caused significant damage to the underlying tissues. Um, the thing that we worry about the most is you may have damaged some blood vessels and you pull this out, and now you've got bleeding that's not controllable, and you're out in the backwoods, and there's no easy place to go. So in general, if you've got something sticking out of your body, leave it in, don't take it out, seek definitive medical care, medical care as quickly as possible. If you've got an individual who has a, a bleeder, um, important in all these scenarios, take a big depth, deep breath. Assess the situation. Don't panic. You know, knowledge, most important thing. What upstairs is the most important uh, tool that you have, especially when you're uh, providing first aid in the backcountry. So assess the situation. Um, put pressure on it. Take a deep breath. Make sure everything else is fine. That you're not in danger. The scout's not in danger. And then gently lift up your hand in the dressing and look at that blood. Oftentimes, uh, in a laceration or cut will bleed a lot just from the venous bleeding, just from the skin. But if it's just running out, oozing, while that may be bad and look bad, um, it's important to know if it's just running out. The ones we worry, we're, we really worry about, when you take the dressing off and there's a squirter and the blood is shooting out of the wound and it's shooting out of the wound as if every heartbeat so it squirts boom 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 and every squirt represents the beat of your heart 
those are much more significant. In general, it doesn't matter what it is, whether it's a venous injury where it's continuously oozing, a muscle injury which has lots of uh, uh, little blood vessels, or a big arterial injury, the pumpers. When you're hiking, backpacking, put pressure on that wound and don't even look at it for 10 minutes. Don't look at it for 10 minutes. Because again, when you're backpacking, you're camping, you have limited resources, your, your threshold for error is much lower. So put pressure on that wound, get someone else, get a first aid kit, get everything else assembled, take a deep breath, think, clear your processes, and, and don't even look. Constant firm compression for 10 minutes and then take a look and reassess the situation. The vast majority of the time, the vast majority of the time, that bleeding will stop um, with 10 minutes of constant firm compression. If someone has a significant injury and they're in danger of losing their limb or their life, sometimes you have to apply a tourniquet. If you apply a tourniquet, it's important to get use a wide tourniquet, use a shirt or something, but make the band that you're applying across the leg or the arm as wide as possible. Don't use a string, um, a rope, because it provides too much compressive forces over a small area. Again, you can use a sit pad or something, take a wrap it around and then really squeeze it tight, but now you're distributing forces. Ideally, someone has a pen or a pencil um, in their pack, and if you have to apply a tourniquet, to save someone's limb or your life. You put it up and you take that Sharpie and you make a note of what time that was put on. When a tourniquet has been applied, I use tourniquets all the time in the operating room and we don't like to keep them up greater than two hours because after two hours it starts causing muscle ischemia, lack of oxygen to the muscle. Um, if you keep it on longer than that, um, that lack of oxygen can start damaging the muscles or the nerves. If that tourniquet is on four hours, five hours, and oftentimes it's about six hours, depending on where it's located. If that tourniquet is on six hours or longer, everything distal to the tourniquet typically will die, and that person is gonna lose their arm or their leg distal to where the tourniquet was applied. Oftentimes in these injuries, there's so much going on, people get scared, they panic, they put a tourniquet on, they forget to take it off, or they forget to know what time they put it on. It's really critical when you get that individual to seek definitive care that we know what time that tourniquet was applied. The most important thing is putting that pressure on for 10 minutes and don't even look. After 10 minutes, take a peek. Again, almost all the time the bleeding will have stopped and you do not need to use a tourniquet. The tourniquet should only be used for life threatening or limb threatening situations. It's really important if someone has an injury to keep that injured part above the height of the heart. We can make all these little fancy slings and splints. You can oftentimes make a sling out of a shirt where you just make a little sling around the neck and just create a little loop around the wrist. And that's probably all you need for uh, just a little simple sling. Simple um, little sheet or rope and take a little thing by the wrist but as a hand and upper extremity surgeon I am not a big fan of slings and one of the reasons when you wear a sling like this typically your injured part down here is below the height of your heart and it was below the height of your heart and you've got a broken bone or dislocation or open wound that continues to bleed and swell more important to keep that arm way up in the air so you want your fingers higher than your wrist your wrist higher than your elbow and your elbow higher than your heart. Way up in the air, wiggling the fingers as much as you can, and that strict elevation and wiggling the fingers will decrease the swelling. When you put your splint on, if your fingers are free, it's optimal if you've got a wrist injury, because these are like little pump handles, and these pump handles will milk all the blood fluid back to your heart. So if you can, make a provisional splint or sling and keep the fingers free so allows the individual to use their fingers is very helpful and beneficial. 
speaking of wiggling your fingers, one of the reasons I really like hiking poles so much is when we do this uh, long backpacking treks, if you don't have hiking poles, your hands are always in a dependent position. They're below the height of your heart. And after several miles, your fingers start to swell, they get stiff, and you have a difficult time making a full fist. When you're carrying hiking poles, your hands are always gripping and squeezing the hiking poles. And they're like these little pump handles and they're milking all the blood and fluid back. And your fingers are much happier. They're not swollen and they're not stiff. Thermal burns, very common. One of the most common injuries you see in scouts are thermal burns uh, when from cooking. You spill some hot water uh, um, and something gets tipped, an individual gets burned from boiling water. Um, most important thing is oftentimes we're camping and we're in the wilderness, we don't have a whole lot of first aid or ice, but oftentimes we're camping near a lake or a river or stream and you want to submerge that part in cold water as quickly as you can, as long as you can. Ideally 20, 30 minutes or longer. Um, and that process will greatly decrease the extent of the thermal injury and minimize the soft tissue damage obtained from that burn. If you have to submerge someone in a river or a lake and it's really cold, be careful that you don't over treat them in the sense that you do great treatment for their thermal burn injury, but give them um, hypothermia by making them so cold by uh, submerging them uh, in the cold river or the lake. In my wilderness first aid kit, I like to carry a few additional items. I always like to carry at least one pair of sterile surgical gloves in case I need to do some type of procedure. I carry lots of different band-aids of various sizes and shapes. I like to carry a number of alcohol wipes, which I can use to sterilize the skin or potential instruments, along with betadine, which is a great antiseptic. I usually carry a couple packs of bacitracin ointment or triple antibiotic ointment which you can use for lots of minor uh, injuries. And I'm a big fan of Steri strips. I carry several different sizes of Steri strips. And to make these adhere better, I usually take some benzoin tincture or massasol. And this is a little ampule. You crack the ampule, the fluid goes out here onto this little sponge. You wipe it across the wound on both sides, that makes the skin very sticky. You let it air dry for a few seconds, and then you apply your steri strips. Um, many, many uh, skin injuries and laceration, or lacerations can be provisionally treated after the wound is cleansed with soap, water, cleansed with the alcohol prep, um, with application of steri strips and this uh, benzoin tincture. These should carry a non-occlusive a dressing or two over the wound so the dressing does not stick. I like to use Adaptic or Xeroform. <coughs> Adaptic works well to allow the fluid uh, to escape. It's a little bit more porous. The Xeroform has a little better antibacterial properties. So if I'm really worried about infection, um, I'll apply a Xeroform. Both of these work great. If you have access to either one of them, uh, it'll be wonderful. It helps the dressing so it does not stick to the wound. And when you take off the dressing, it's much less painful. I always carry a number of uh, sterile gauze sponges in case I need them, along with a wrapping. Uh, this is like a stretch bandage so I can wrap my wound. And then I cover that with uh, either a small ace wrap or the Coban wrap that I showed earlier. When I'm backpacking, I also like to carry a few different medications with me just in case anyone needs anything. Again, typically less is more, and knowledge is uh, critically important. I could take a whole toolbox full of medications, but these are the ones that I typically take. This isn't really medication, but this is MicroPure tablets to uh, sterilize water. 
In general, we're always using water filtration, but I take a number of these MicroPure tablets along just in case we have an issue with our water filters and it's just a backup. Not uncommon to go on a camping trip and have someone have a cold and flu type symptoms. So I usually carry some uh, cold and flu uh, type medicine along with Claritin in case someone has some uh, allergic symptoms or developing a seasonal type allergies. And oftentimes we'll carry along some pseudoephedrine nasal decongestant tablets. If someone has a runny nose, the pseudoephedrine works wonderfully to uh, st uh, stop up someone's uh, runny nose. We talked it's not uncommon to do these ultralight backpacking treks, long distance mileage when you're hiking for scouts to get some chafing um, between their legs and a little uh, baby powder uh, works wonderful for that. Even better is that tri-glide, that shoe glide, that uh, running type goo they can get uh, for your toes. That works wonderfully and actually works much better than this. Oftentimes carry a little tablet of a little pain relieving cream in case someone has a little injury. And for medications, I take a number of Tylenol. Um, usually take one or two tablets, 500 milligram tablets every six hours as needed. If someone has a, a fever, aches, or pain, ibuprofen works wonderfully, wonderfully from an anti-inflammatory standpoint. And if someone has an injury, you can alternate ibuprofen and Tylenol. Usually for an adult, you're taking 600 milligrams. So you're taking three of these 200 milligram tablets. For a youth, oftentimes you're taking, uh, for a scout age, is usually two to three of these tablets every six hours. I would alternate the ibuprofen and the Tylenol, taking uh, each of them every uh, six to eight hours uh, apart. So you're alternating every three to four hours. If someone develops an anaphylactic reaction, they're developing hives, swelling, uh, Benadryl can work out wonders. And I usually carry some 25 milligram tablets of Benadryl. This uh, can make someone uh, quite uh, sleepy. I also carry a number of aspirin. This is quite a few aspirin. Um, but if someone is potentially on the trail, this is usually an adult, they're potentially having heart attack type symptoms where they're squeezing pain in their chest, pain radiating down their left arm, into their jaw, they're nauseous, they're diaphoretic. If you're concerned that someone has a potential heart attack, I would give them an aspirin. And since you're in the back country, I'd give them uh, uh, three or four of these tablets and have them chew the tablets to allow the absorption to be a little quicker. If someone develops traveler's type diarrhea from not being sanitary, not washing their hands with the soap and water, or using hand sanitizer after they go to the bathroom, uh, sometimes Imodium can help those loose stools or sometimes people just get loose stools from not being used to eating a mountain house type uh, diet. And I showed this before, uh, triple antibiotic ointment um, is a must to have in every wilderness first aid backpack. I also include some drops in case someone develops a corneal abrasion, has a foreign body in their eye, or has allergic uh, symptoms, either these blink tears or refresh lubricant eye drops work very well. And I always carry a few of these in my ultralight backpacking first aid kit. And then I store all these medications in my little plastic bag, and I have a number of these little plastic bags which I store in my little wilderness first aid kit.